What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so our indie videos are usually just kind of videos I just throw out there, and it's just like things that I think are kind of cool, and they're basically comics not published by Marvel or DC. That's really kind of like the whole idea of, of indie stuff. Valiant, I would consider to be like the third biggest publisher in terms of shared continuity. I mean, overall, Image is bigger, but Image does not have a shared continuity. You're never going to see Spawn cross over with East of West, which is kind of disappointing because that would be really, really interesting to see. I think it'd actually be, be, uh, be really kind of cool, but the fact remains here that uh, there are a line of comics about uh, the aliens, the xenomorphs, <laughs> and it's actually really cool. Um, I was kind of thinking about this with regards to Alien Covenant coming out, which I'm really, really excited about. But the funny thing about this is that these comics basically treat everything after James Cameron's Aliens to be non-existent, which is what we all pretty much do anyway. So because of that, um, it, it's kind of weird. In this story, you have Hicks and you have Newt, but the problem is they reference Hicks as Wilkes and they reference Newt as Billy. We're not going to do that. We're going to call him Hicks and Newt because that's the name that most everybody knows. Which, by the way, if you have never seen Aliens, one, why? And two, you're missing out. Like, that's one of the very few, like, there was a really good segment in Scream where they were talking about, like, sequels. Very few times do sequels ever surpass their originals. But Aliens does it. Terminator 2 does it. Uh, the new Blade Runner movie will not do that. But, you know, it happens from time to time, and it's actually kind of a cool thing to see. The reason why, though, the reason why these characters are called Wilkes and Billy is because of the fact that these came out almost immediately after Aliens because Aliens was such a huge hit. It was a blockbuster film and is still one of the greatest movies ever made to this day. It's almost as good as Jaws. Not as, not quite, but almost as good as Jaws. Uh, but the fact remains here that because of the fact that Alien 3 came out and depicted the death of Hicks and the de uh, death of Newt, basically... Dark Horse had to go back and just like rework these comics and change the name to fit into the continuity. The good thing is that we don't have to do that. So the cool thing is that this initially picks up with Newt and it actually takes place about 10 years after the events of Aliens. And what we end up finding out here is that Newt is basically in a mental institution. She's in an asylum. Now, we're not told explicitly why right off the bat. All we're really told is that she's basically confined here because she couldn't cope with her life, uh, really with, with the things that were going on around her. Now, in terms of what she was having a hard time coping with, this is the the opening salvo of this story. Newt is basically suffering from night terrors. And what I mean by that is she's talking to her psychiatrist and she basically talks about a dream she has. And the dream takes place on LV-426, of course, the planet where Aliens 2 took place. But what she does is she basically tells us a story about her and a couple of her friends uh, who were camping. This is kind of cool because it shows us how things work in relation to the whole alien mythos, uh, you know, in the far-flung future in excess of the year 2100. But it's basically this idea that things that we do, like camping, stuff like that, are long since gone. That uh, there aren't really like fireplaces and things like that, or there aren't really like campfires or anything. Instead, everything's just really technologically advanced. And so the little little tidbits of what we consider to be, you know, advanced life now are considered to be archaic uh, here in the future. But the issue is that they all start taking turns telling stories. And when it comes for Newt's opportunity, they're like, surely you know a scary story. And she starts running over the events of LV-426. Basically what we saw in the movie, which is to say, if you saw the special edition, that, uh, you know, her, her parents are basically tasked with going out and searching a ship, which was done by, you know, I guess the message was sent by Burke. And uh, and the result was that uh, her father was basically attached by a face hugger and the infestation spread throughout the entire uh, the entire compound. But in the midst of, rec of, of of this whole dream, what ends up happening is her friends basically begin succumbing to an infestation, which is to say aliens start bursting out of their chests. And of course, what this does is it basically sets the stage for showing that her character is suffering from issues time and time again, suffering from problems over and over and over again. Of course, this leads to her more or less wandering the halls. It leads to her sleepwalking, you know, and in this instance, she was caught beating on a wall in the middle of her night terrors. And so because of this, um, this really begins to shift over to Hicks himself and Hicks suffers the same fate. He suffers from nightmares. The difference here is that Hicks has the ability to sort of overcome these or at least handle them a little bit better than Newt ever did. And the reason why is because of the fact that remember with the character of Newt, uh, she was essentially suffering from all these major issues. I mean, she was a little kid that basically experienced this heinous series of events. But for Hicks, he was a colonial marine. All he knew was conflict and death, and so he was able to adapt to these nightmares better than uh, better than Newt was. Now, at this point, we switch over to a ship or to a vessel called the SS Dutton, and the Dutton is basically a ship that serves the purpose of uh, operating as the Coast Guard, and essentially what we're told here is that somewhere along the line, various ships, when their tenure was over, they were allowed to basically just kind of crash land into Earth. Decaying orbit would cause the ships to break up when they hit, me, uh, hit the atmosphere or something along those lines. The issue was that a ship eventually crashed off the coast of 
of Hawaii, and between the explosion and the nuclear radiation that was let off because of the nuclear-powered engine, it ended up killing a ton of people in Hawaii. And so now what happens is the Coast Guard basically goes out to these various derelict ships who are no longer, you know, that are no longer being used, um, that are basically abandoned, blow them up, and then just kind of allow them to either burn up in the atmosphere or else just kind of float harmlessly through space. The issue is that when the crew from the Dutton gets onto this derelict ship, we end up finding out there's a xenomorph, uh, xenomorph on board. Now, in terms of how this xenomorph got here, we're really not given an answer. We're simply just told that it was a stowaway on this one particular vessel, and that makes sense just because of the fact that xenomorphs are so prevalent throughout, you know, the, the universe in terms, or really in, throughout the, the galaxy and so on in terms of the, the alien mythos, that it could have been picked up from anywhere. And so because of that, all these guys on the, on the Dutton are killed, and that's really the end of them. And so what we end up finding out is that all of this has been observed by the government, and what they end up doing is they basically reach out to Hicks. And the reason why is because of the fact that where he had been considered a crazy person before, there's now merit to his argument that there are a group of aliens out there that are basically able to survive in space, they're immune to almost all conventional weapons, save for fire and high-powered rounds, and the result is that the government now wants to harness one of these specimens. So, but where the plot begins to thicken is when we pick up with a guy by the name of Salvage. Now, this guy is basically a religious fanatic. He's he's a guy uh, who worked for a company called Bio uh, Biotech National or something along those lines. Bio National Technology, I think is what it is. But basically, this was another company in addition to the government. And Bio Bio National Tech basically wanted to grab a uh, a xenomorph specimen for themselves and then use it for their own ends. The issue with this is that Salvage used to work for Bio National, but as a guy who was basically previewed to these different you know xenomorphs, these different aliens, he began to develop an obsession himself. But in his mind, it wasn't about harnessing a xenomorph and using it for bio warfare. Instead, it was viewing the xenomorph as like a messiah that the, the the xenomorph would basically bring in the true era of a god, so to speak, and he would purge all the non-believers from the face of the planet Earth. And so what he ends up doing is he basically grabs some kind of a some guy that basically works on the black market as a tech who's able to hack into the internet, which is highly monitored by the U.S. government, bypass all these different safeties and firewalls, and begin broadcasting a message designed to brainwash people who see it and rally them to his cause. And so because of this, we end up transitioning back over to uh, Newt, and we kind of jump back and forth between Newt and, uh, and and Corporal Hicks. Now, with regards to, to Newt herself, it's really just kind of her in an institution, again, just sort of, you know, showing us that she's struggling with the world around her, but also the idea that she's constantly on met. She's constantly being sedated because of the fact that she has these outbursts. But there's also a little bit of crookedness going on here in the sense that she has a, uh, a hearing that's coming up that's going to determine whether or not she's actually crazy. But in order to maintain itself, this uh, mental institution is essentially uh, going through taking people, people like Newt, for example, keeping them sedated, and then in the days before their hearings, uh, basically lobotomizing them, saying, hey, look, we had no other choice. She was beyond hope. We did everything we could, but it just didn't work out. And even going so far as to cook the books in order to make it look like there was never an instance where she showed any signs of improvement. So again, uh, it's really this idea that we're going to be seeing a much darker side of the story, and that Newt herself is going to be, uh, or at least it's presumed, that she's going to be lobotomized. Now, in terms of Hicks himself, we get, for the most part, a bit of a, of, of a refresher that's going on here in terms of, you know, how he functions and what he does and, and different things like that. We basically join him when he's picking up with uh, a guy by the name of, of Colonel Stevens and a guy named An Anora, I think it's, or Onora uh, is how you pronounce it. But regardless, it's really just kind of rehashing things that we've already seen with regards to his character. So we basically get like a rundown of the events of Aliens, but we're also shown a little bit of what his life was like before Aliens, which is to say that he had a sterling uh, reputation as a Marine in terms of carrying out the very uh, various missions without error leading his uh, leading his group or his platoon I think it's called uh, leading them into to combat situations ensuring people got out alive the problem is that after the events of LV-426 his life took a drastic turn he couldn't cope with life as it existed around him you know with with everything kind of following him not only that the people that he knew thought he was basically tainted because of the events on LV-426 that the the xenomorphs had somehow contaminated him and so because of that they would basically avoid him or else others would taunt him which would lead to like bar fights and different things like that and so because of this we actually end up having Hicks going to visit uh, going to visit Newt. And the funny thing about this is that Dark Horse kind of teases the idea that there's a romance between the two of them. Now, there, there's actually not. It's really more of like a father-daughter relationship more so than anything else. But in a lot of ways, she's the only person that really understands where he's coming from. Now, this brings into, in, into sharp relief the one question that I'm sure a lot of you have been asking. Where is Ellen Ripley? Ellen Ripley is not in this story. And Ellen Ripley's fate is never given to us. We never find out what happens to her. She's only referenced once and somebody talks about you know says the girl and well you know what happened to her and that's it that's all we get now she will make a return but for the sake of this story it was designed to focus only on corporal hicks and uh and newt
And now what we end up finding out here is that with the two of them talking and basically reconciling, that they're essentially struggling with everything that's going on. They're not quite able to grasp the gravity of their situation in terms of, you know, how far they've fallen. That is to say the nightmares they have, the terrible experiences they have, but the fact that they're both trying to uh, function at the same time and trying to keep their lives going. Now, at this point, we jump to the introduction of a guy named Massey. And those are really kind of like the, the main guys in this story. There's Salvage, there's Massey, there's Hicks, and there's Newt. Newt is kind of an aside character. She'll be just there until we end up getting, you know, towards the end of the story. But Massey is a guy who is, uh, he's a sociopath. He's crazy as hell. But he ended up killing his parents when he was a kid. Uh, he got an MBA from Cornell in like business law or something like that. Like he got a law degree, you know, and then he ended up uh, joining the Marine Corps. And the reason why is because he just liked killing things. The problem is that he punched out his CO when Massey was basically making the case that there were, you know, terrorists inside of a, a camp or something like that. His CO objected. Uh, Massey knocked out his CO and then went through and killed 85 men, women, and children. And so because of that, where he normally would have been court-martialed, Bionational actually bought out the tribunal and then hired Massey so that he'd be considered not guilty. And then they, they basically hired him on. And the reason for this is because Bionational is chasing the government, where the government basically grabs Hicks and, you know, and says, hey, look, we want you to fund an expedition where you are going to go to the Xenomorph homeworld and you are going to basically bring a Xenomorph specimen back here. Bionational already has a specimen and we'll actually find out what, what specimen they end up having. But Bionational already has a Xenomorph. Their goal is to keep the government from being involved in the whole biotech weapons race so that they can in turn sell what they have to the government. So again, it's, it's basically corporate sabotage is really what they're going for. But in the midst of this, we end up finding out that Hicks had basically uh, hacked into the Fieldcrest home for the mentally insane and was monitoring the various uh, conversations and live feeds regarding Newt. And what we end up finding out here from Hicks' perspective is that they're going to lobotomize Newt, take away her ability to, to feel or understand anything, and she's going to be a shell of herself. And so in a last ditch effort, Hicks breaks in and actually frees Newt. The problem with this is this happens just before the mission. And so nobody can scuttle the mission. Nobody knows that she's there. He stows her away and then they take off into space and they basically exist for about nine months later. Now, the other half of this is we also get a little more um, expansion on what's going on with the character of Massey in terms of just how dark he is. Where Massey had been hired by Bionational, Massey's actions were very disconcerting. And the reason why was because of the fact that Massey was basically given information on his newest mission by Bionational, which was to chase after Hicks's ship as the government was trying to get to the, uh, to the Xenomorph homeworld. And the issue with this was that the message was sent unencrypted, which meant that his wife and his son saw the message about the Xenomorphs. And as a result, Massey broke the necks of his wife and his son and then made it look like a double homicide and the cops helped him to clean it up. So again, it was a pretty, it's a pretty dark scenario, a pretty screwed up situation. But at this point, we switch over to a guy by the name of James Lakowski or Jim Lakowski. And this is when we find out Bio Nationals, uh, basically what it is that they have under their belt in terms of their own specimen. What ended up happening here? And again, we're not really told exactly how this happens, but what ended up happening here is somewhere along the line, Jim Lakowski was basically attacked by a face hugger and planted with a xenomorph. The issue was that he was brought back by Bionational to their Hudson headquarters, and the result is that they've been monitoring him every se uh, ever since. Now, there is just as much about science and research, you know, as anything else, and so they're doing exactly what the government would have done. They would have studied Jim to see how the xenomorph functions, what it does, and so we're given a little bit of information here. Uh, by this day and age, it's not anything we don't already know, but back when this comic first came out, it was a ton of stuff that nobody knew. <laughs> Nobody knew about the gestation process of the Xenomorphs. All we really knew is whatever came out with the special edition of Alien, where we actually found out that the original life cycle of the Xenomorph was going to be that there were basically eggs, and the eggs were going to, uh, you know, release face huggers that would attach to people. Um, in turn, those would give birth to new Xenomorphs, and then those individuals would be basically rematerialized into uh, into cocoons to keep the entire process going. There's a really, really cool scene in the Alien special edition when Ripley goes down to the cargo hold, I think it is, and ends up finding like Dallas and uh, I can't remember who the other guy was but ends up finding Dallas being converted into a cocoon and she ends up setting him on fire just because they asked her to but the fact remains that it, it was a pretty haunting moment but you know this new uh, this new life cycle as it was created by James Cameron which is to say the queen you know planting cocoons and then so on and so forth um this is basically what they're studying and so in their mind they don't know how long the gestation period lasts all they know is that you know Jim Jim Lakowski has been planted with a xenomorph and at some point it will emerge from him but even they don't 
know how this happens because keep in mind lv426 is way out there and with the exception of people who were able to gain access to the different to the various files that were provided by the federal government or picked up by the government as well as whatever statements were made by newt and hicks no one really knows how xenomorphs function and so because of that again it's just as much research and study as it is anything else and so because of this what we end up doing is we actually jump back over to hicks only to find out you know that colonel stevens did not know again that, that newt was on board but ultimately found the stowaway and then of course forced hicks to reveal uh, that he had brought her on board now in truth because of the fact that there's so much politics going on here not much really ends up playing out it's really just kind of the idea that hicks himself you know is just kind of like hey look we can deal with this when we get back but for right now we've got more important things to deal with but in the midst of all this someone and we don't know who is going through and killing people on the ship effectively sabotaging it and so again it's creating all kinds of different uh, different and crazy situations but jumping back over to uh, to jim lakowski the moment whereby the uh the the xenomorph begins to emerge what he ends up doing is grabbing the gun from one of the guards and then shooting other guards and then making his escape uh going back to really his wife it seems to be you know telling her of course that he loves her and then being recaptured now the way that this is written is is actually a little confusing in the sense that we don't know if this was all in his head or we don't know if it actually happened and that's kind of the issue here because he's basically taken by one of the guys and then he suddenly just jumps back to the uh, to the table where the xenomorph is getting ready to break out and it's basically a repeat of what we saw before now one of the issues with the way this was written back in 1989 is it wasn't written supremely well and so because of that there were a few issues here and there in terms of linking things up you know for example we jump over to another section and another event that's taking place with hicks but we don't really know that it's them right off the bat we simply just kind of have to look at the environment and then realize they're on a ship so it's a little a little wild in terms of how it unfolds but ultimately this xenomorph actually begins to emerge and the head of the entire project wants to see the birthing process and so in the middle of all this jim Lakowski actually grabs the guy pulls his head to him and of course the xenomorph bursts out you know goes through the guy's chest kills the head of the entire operation and then from there it's basically just keeping the xenomorph contained so the outbreak on earth the, the earthly infestation does not hail from this it's basically them you know it was, it was a close call the xenomorph almost got away uh, but it was basically them able to keep the entire thing contained and uh, and keep anything from from going awry and so what ends up happening here is we end up finding out that where bio national was basically keeping this uh, this xenomorph in stasis that the xenomorph was a queen and they were allowing it to molt they were allowing it to go through its entire process to eventually you know grow to its full fruition to the point where it would begin the process of laying eggs now this is a very dangerous game and the reason why is because bio national again does not know exactly how the xenomorphs work they have a good idea but they're basically learning about them as they watch them so all they know is there's this massive 20 foot queen you know basically with a with an ovipositor planting these eggs all over the place and they don't really know what's going to happen i mean they know that you know if they walk up to one of the eggs that a face hugger will latch onto them but they don't know how fast these things grow what we end up finding out is that through the actions of salvage and the fact that he's basically amassed hundreds if not thousands of followers through his uh, different broadcasts that one of these individuals actually comes up to the bio national building where the queen alien is being held with a bunch of explosives around her waist and blows it up effectively blowing a hole in the entire facility and then allowing all of salvage's followers and salvage himself to enter the facility now the crazy thing about this is that it's only at the moment when he's bonded with a face hugger the salvage realizes the gravity of his crimes in his mind he was so far gone he was so far involved in religious zealotry that he didn't realize what it was that he was getting into in his mind he was able to he was going to be able to communicate with the xenomorphs he was going to be able to talk to them he was going to be able to say hey look you know you guys can have all these different people around the world but don't touch us because we're your loyal followers we love you but as we know xenomorphs are driven by instinct but this is what salvage didn't grasp in his mind they were intelligent he could communicate with them so on and so forth and so again these xenomorphs the face huggers do not differentiate between salvage and anybody else and all of his followers are basically attacked now for the crazy people who were there that's what they were shooting for in the first place but because of the fact that you know all this is basically going crazy and all of it's running amok what ends up happening is bio national calls in their own guys and they begin the process of shooting the place up basically trying to kill off as many of salvage's followers as they possibly can now salvage does not immediately die instead things are just kind of going you know kind of running amok and, and that's really kind of it but uh jumping back to to corporal hicks jumping back into space again we end up picking up with the arrival of massey remember massey was sent by bio national for the purpose of sabotaging the government sanctioned uh mission to the xenomorph homeworld in order to grab a specimen for themselves now with massey coming up what we end up finding out here is that the person who was going through and killing people and uh and basically sabotaging the mission from the inside was colonel stevens colonel stevens has been working for bio national now we don't know exactly how they got him money seems to be 
be the most logical cause, but we simply know that he's working among their ranks. The issue with this is that with Massey being a new arrival, he does not know that Newt is a stowaway. So it's kind of a cool scenario. Not only that, we also get a few Easter eggs here in the sense that much like in the original Aliens movie, or I guess, you know, really Aliens by James Cameron, uh, what ended up happening is of course we stumbled across Newt when she was hiding out in the various ventilation shafts. That's exactly what happens here. Uh, Newt basically takes to the ventilation shafts and begins playing more of a reconnaissance role, listening to the things that Massey's saying, how Massey's taking uh, taking Hicks prisoner, how Massey's basically there to sabotage the mission, to kill off all the Marines, different things like that, but it can't be done in a way that looks illegit, because remember, the government always keeps tabs on what it is that's going on, and so where Stevens was able to sabotage things to a degree, the mission has to look like a complete and total catastrophe. And so what ends up happening here is Massey basically forces all the Marines to descend down onto the surface of the Xenomorph homeworld, and then what's going to follow is basically just a bloodbath. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, they go in there and they had no clue what it was that they were getting into. You know, now one, this is the Xenomorph, uh, Xenomorph homeworld, which means the numbers are higher here than anywhere else. Now, we'll actually find out later on in the uh, in the Xenomorph comics, assuming that we get that far into it, that there's actually a civil war among the aliens. You have the red and you have the black ones. And so there's basically kind of their own little civil war taking place. And it's a really cool built up and drawn out concept. But the fact remains here that with uh, Massey basically continuing to hold Hicks hostage and watching the events unfold, we basically have, you know, Newt making her presence here. Now, this is kind of interesting because remember, Massey's still going by the idea that this all has to seem like a catastrophe. And so because of that, he actually sets the ship to self-destruct. And what'll happen is it'll basically look like Hicks and all those guys went to the Xenomorph homeworld. Xenomorphs basically overran them. And in a last ditch effort to ensure the Xenomorphs wouldn't get back to Earth, that they scuttled the mission and blew up the ship. And so again, it's kind of an interesting way for the events to play out. But Newt basically ends up killing uh, killing Massey. But then at this point, uh, it's basically kind of recalling everybody back and trying to get out of there as best they can. The problem is that multiple people aren't really able to, to make it out on their own. Now, the crazy thing about this is that Newt herself had actually fallen in love with a guy by the name of Bueller. And what that did is it created a source of contention between Hicks and Newt in the sense that, again, Hicks looked at her very much as like a, you know, looked at her like a daughter. And so because of that, it was like seeing his own daughter basically moving on and, and having a relationship, different things like that. Now, I wouldn't deny that there was some measure of attraction between uh, Hicks and Newt, even if only on the side of Hicks. But the fact remains here that Bueller had basically shown uh, shown Newt that there was a better way besides the cold nature that she'd experienced so far in terms of, you know, how brutally she was treated and when she was at the, the mental institution, the fact that she was having nightmares all the time, he represented a better life. The problem is that while he was one of the individuals who had gone down to the surface during the whole Xenomorph attack, we end up finding out that Bueller is actually an android, that he's not a human. And so again, it's, it's kind of crazy that we get these cool little just sudden drops, these these uh, these kind of crazy moments. Not only that, we end up finding out that most of the guys that were alongside Massey were androids. Now, this is very, very smart, and it's actually really cool. Androids, despite the fact that within the, the, the alien mythos, you know, they can be programmed really to ensure that they never harm a person or that a person is never harmed, they can be reprogrammed. They can be reprogrammed to serve whatever purpose they're programmed for. And so Massey most likely, or really Bionational, most likely had them set up to follow Massey's orders without question. And so, of course, when he basically sent all of them down to the service alongside the Marines, um, it basically served the purpose of the Marines being bait. And so it would end up to, you know, end up with the Marines all being executed and then the entire thing, uh, you know, really kind of coming to a close. The problem is that the story begins to get a little crazy, get a little wonky once we end up with the arrival of one of the space jockeys. Now, keep in mind, this is long before Prometheus and Prometheus actually changed a lot of the stuff that, that was here. When this story first came out, there was no Prometheus. All we knew was that there was just the space jockey in the first Alien movie when they got inside the ship and that was it. We didn't know anything else. And so because of that, this space jockey basically demonstrates telepathic abilities. And what it does is it communicates directly with uh, with Newt and it both reads her mind and feeds her information at the same time. And what it basically tells her is that the iconic space jockey, the one that we think of when we think of the first Alien, was the friend of this existing space jockey, more or less. And so this jockey basically showed up on the Xenomorph homeworld uh, out of revenge more so than anything else. And so because of that, where this jockey is able to kill, you know, a lot of these Xenomorphs with the greatest of ease, really showing no uh, no difficulty whatsoever, we end up picking up with, with Newt and Hicks, uh, essentially just bailing out of the planet, taking off, heading back to Earth, and then we transition back over to Earth itself. And what we find out is that about a year after these events had taken place, again, because of the fact that it takes a little over a year to get from Earth over to the Xenomorph homeworld, during this time when Newt and Hicks are basically making their return trip, we end up finding out that some of these individuals who were infected by the Xenomorphs uh, basically survived the entire, you know, massacre by Bionational. And so the result was that the Xenomorph infestation began to spread throughout the world, that various people began experiencing Xenomorphs kind of exploding out of them. We end up having 
of course, um, uh, Salvage, who survives on a plane, indicating that we're going to see a xenomorph uh, outbreak on this plane. We end up having, you know, various instances where queen aliens begin to manifest, where they begin to grow. So the Earth has multiple queens. And then, of course, we have the government trying to crack down on everything by killing anybody who's infected and killing every xenomorph where they can. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because they grow so rapidly and they grow so fast that there is there's almost no way to stop the entire infestation process. And so what happens is the story essentially ends on the idea that Hicks and Newt are going to return to Earth only to find out that where they left one massive problem, one massive mission failure going to the Xenomorph homeworld, they're going to come back to Earth and find that the entire Earth has been infected with xenomorphs. But with that being said, guys, if you are new here to Comments Explain, you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, make sure you hit the sub button to become a, Rob, a member of the Rob Corps, and let me know if you guys want to see more xenomorph stuff like this, because it's really cool, and it's, it's, it's really interesting in terms of how it all unfolds and, and what all happens. But anyway, guys, uh, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end, and I will catch you all later. Peace.